to um, our guest today and uh, to all of you for coming today and this evening, taking our time specially for Maja House. We welcome you all. And um, you know, Preeti Hill as it is, we all know, she's, she's very, very popular. No, she doesn't need an introduction. But just for you know your information and uh, <laughs> answers, I just give you a little briefing on Preeti Gill, the founder of Maja House and this uh, literary cultural platform. She's an independent literary agent who has more than 20 years of experience in the publishing industry as a commissioning editor and rights director. She has traveled extensively in the northeast of India and written on issues of conflict and women. She is the editor of the Peripheral Center, Voices from India's Northeast, as well as Bearing Witness, a report on the impact of conflict on women in Nagaland and Assam. Her writing has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including 1984, In Memory and Imagination, 200, 2016. Her documentary, Ramboa, Rambau, how do you pronounce it? Rambau, okay. Rambau, okay. Uh, Mizoram's Trouble Years, co-produced with Sanjay Hazarika, was released in September 2016. And she has edited She Stoops to Kill, an anthology of murder stories by women as well as insider, outsider. Belongings and Unbelonging in India's Northeast, both published in 2019. She has built up an elected list of women writers from the Northeast when she worked as commissioning editor at Zuban, a female feminist publisher based in Delhi. As an independent literary agent, she represents many of the best known, most respected award winning writers from the region. She spends her time between Delhi and Amritsar, where she has set up a literary and cultural hub, the first of its kind called Maja House which regularly holds literary and cultural events and festivals. And in the past, we had such fun, fantastic festivals, you know, and they are the attraction to the Amritsar people, even outside Amritsar. Her new forthcoming publications are an edited volume of non-fiction essays on Punjab and the second volume of Insider, Outsider, or India's Northeast. So I present Kriti Gill and Gugu Gill, the founder and the, you know, the organizers, the founders, and the ones that have given us this uh, you know, platform to rent out our you know talent, and and you know it's kind of a you know it builds up so much of uh, you know uh, like you know you're mentally you're active, you're alert, and kind of uh, all these literary programs that we have, you know they really stimulate your mind, and we have so much to learn from Preeti Gill. <laughs> okay, now uh, uh, this thing. an introduction to Anjan Malhotra. She's an Indian historian. She's an Indian historian and writer, best known for her work on oral history and material culture of the partition of India in 1947. Anjan Malhotra's debut book, Remnants of a Separation, a history of the partition through material memory. memory was published by Harpin Collins in India in 2017 to mark the 70th anniversary of Indian independence. For the 75th anniversary of the partition in 2022, Malhotra published a follow-up in language of remembering the inheritance of partition, which focused on the contemporary relevance of the partition in everyday lives of Indians, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, and her debut novel, The Book of Everlasting Things, also published in 2022. Wow. So, welcome. Wow. And uh, another one, I just want to know that she's a friend of Artika's, and her dad has been doing the publishing for Artika's books. So, from me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed the evening. especially Archal because we've uh, had Archal on uh, Maja House uh, 
sessions earlier, but mostly online. Yeah. And this is the first time that she's actually come here. And of course, I've also known her family for a while, her father, because he's uh, not only a publisher and a literary agent, but he has a series of bookshops, especially the iconic one called Bari Sons in uh, Greater Kailash, which, uh, sorry, in uh, Khan Market, which everybody would probably have seen and been to. Um, and over the years, been on many, many panels <laughs> together, while Anuj will sit with his glass of wine on the table and everybody else will say, Are, phir humko kyun nahi mila? very nice. Um, so it's really lovely, I'm glad you're here finally. Um, so what I thought was that it's going to be me, me and Nazi, who's also going to be part of this question answer session today. Um, but right in the beginning, I want you to tell us a little bit about this really wonderful, wonderful book. It's her first work of fiction. She's done two books prior to this. Um, Non-fiction, mostly looking at oral history, uh, gathering the material from partition survivors, and especially material um, objects. So she's going to tell us a little bit about all of that. But first, this book. Uh, a bit about the book and how it came. Uh, uh, before she speaks, up, uh, I would request everyone to please take out your mobile phones and put them on the vibration of the silent phone. I could overhear some tones still now. So please, uh, I would request once again to please take out your cell phones out of your bags and pockets and put them on the silent phone. <laughs> much about different books, thanks to you. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here in Punjab, uh, speaking about this book, it's very special. I always find it a bit hard to explain what the novel is about, primarily because it spans over a century in the lives of two families. So it starts um, in the early 1900s in Lahore, in an undivided India. And it talks about the Vich family who are perfumers and the Khan family who are calligraphers working inside the Wazir Khan Mosque that once had a calligraphic bazaar, uh, not unlike the Urdu bazaar inside uh, the walled city of Delhi. And uh, it talks about how these two families are entwined into each other's lives through the First World War, through the Second World War, through partition, and then in the aftermath of partition by way of artistry, of course, because of perfumery and calligraphy, friendship, um, the fallout over religious differences, uh, by way of love and uh, loyalty, betrayal. So primarily, I would say it is a family story. My the, the book sounds like a love story. When you pick it up, it sounds like a love story, but it really is. Um, the story of <coughs> India and Pakistan and how people dealt with the aftermath of partition, how the war impacted us. A large part of the book has to do with the First World War and the Indian soldiers that fought in France and Flanders, which is not something enough, at least younger people know about. The First World War is not in our understanding of Indian history. So it looks at that and then of course it looks at what happens to common people and their relationships when something like partition happens. I don't know how well I've explained the novel, um, but overall, I think that's that's what it is. It is a hundred years of the friendship and relationship between two families, one Hindu, one Muslim. Um, also the fact that you decided to take up fiction, so I'm sure you get asked this question a lot because, yeah. yeah. So why did you go to fiction? And uh, because you, like I said, have already those two really wonderful books, which were heartbreaking uh, seminal works. Uh, how did you decide to write a novel? I, I, I see. I think I'm most comfortable writing nonfiction. I have two nonfiction books, and it comes quite easily to me as well because I write based on real people's real stories. I interview them, spend time with them, write about things that are often considered just memory 
oh, it, this is not history, this is not story, it's just your mother's memory, your grandmother's memory, your father's memory. But I think oral history is a really vital part of how we as South Asians understand uh, our history and also each other. So I spent a large part of my writing career focusing on nonfiction. However, when you are so deeply embedded in any subject as I was with partition, where through people's stories you can recreate entire cities that were destroyed because of partition, the, the landscape, the relationships, the bazaars, uh, all of that. I think that there is always a desire to go beyond reality and see whether you can you can try your hand at seeing how elastic history really is for you to be able to insert fictional characters into it and whether the historical landscape may absorb those characters. So while I would say yes, this is the story or the novel is entirely fiction, it is I could never take off my historian hand. And that was something that was, um, how much is too much? How much can you navigate with that? Uh, and I think fiction allows you the kind of freedom that nonfiction never will. Mm -hmm. It never will, I, I think, to allow a character that you have imagined to go beyond the characteristics you have imagined for them. That was something that I don't think I would have ever even dared to imagine with nonfiction because it's so precious to record real people's stories. You have such a uh, moral obligation to do justice to the manner in which they are narrated to you. But fictional characters are like, like it's like chaos, you know? They have minds of their own. <coughs> and uh, they end up doing things that they are not good for them. And I think the novel, I didn't know everything about the novel. Mm -hmm. And the, the element of surprise at every step kept me very engaged and also it's totally different landscape. Yeah, I would agree with you there. A totally different landscape and um, I mean apart from the fact that huge amount of research has obviously gone into it, but I don't want to talk about that right now. I think let's have a reading because I think the language itself that you use is really stunning because there are parts when, I mean it is visual of course and you're being an artist and looking at things with that eye uh, makes it exceedingly beautiful and uh, I feel that you know we need to get a flavor of the kind of writing it is because it's really beautiful. So, so while I said that this book isn't only a love story, I will read a little part where the two main characters meet for the first time and they're quite young when they meet, like they're 11 and 9 and uh, this is the part where they, they first see each other. As the heavenly rose-colored realm began to emerge at the front of the shop, Fidos let go of her mother's hand and looked around, feeling most out of place. Intrigued by a squeaky sound, she followed it to a low glass cabinet at the back of the Ikhya shop. Hundreds of small, precious glass bottles inside created a natural fortification between Fidos and the boy who sat behind it. She was hunched over some empty bottles in the same way that she was often hunched over a book. She found herself smiling as his tongue crept slightly out of his mouth in concentration, in the same way that hers did when she drew something. Interest peaked. She placed her small palms on the glass cabinet and peered through. Half a year into his internship, Samir was crouched on the ground at the back of the shop, obscured behind a glass cabinet. He drowned each little bottle in a bowl of hot water and then using his fingernails peeled off the gummy worn out labels. Now Samir is an apprentice at this shop. He's very young so obviously he's not given any of the important tasks in the shop. And he's very disappointed. So he's doing that. Samir had barely got through half of the lot when he stopped. Bottle still in hand. He inhaled deeply with closed eyes as a new smell snaked around him. Everything about it was ordinary, yet something stood out so clearly that he was unable to ignore it. He smelled her before he saw her. Lifting his nose above the curtain of his already perfumed environment, he detected rose, orange peels, 
mixed with Nutani Nikki and gram flour. Someone had walked into the shop mm -hmm. carrying the remnants of Uptan. But there was something else, something extraordinary adhered to this ordinary smell. It was musky, warm, soft, calming, sweet. Yes, yes, it was also sweet. Immediately he recalled a bottle of the same substance from a faraway island called Haiti, a highly prized ingredient called vanilla, which his uncle pronounced as Vanille and his father as Vanilla. Could it be? Samir dropped the bottle in the water and smelled further, his eyes still closed. Hints of something else, vaguely smoky, floated into his nostrils. Was it leather or pepper? No, neither. It was denser, warmer, ashy, like coal. Most redolent within this bouquet, though, was the rose. Effortlessly overpowering all else, for a rose could never hide. And just as he brought his nose down from the air, he found a pair of pistachio green eyes staring at him through the rows of glass pockets. It was her. The well, it was her. Samir tried to move, but he couldn't. In fact, all movement occurred in such slow motion, lasting for seconds, minutes or hours, he could not tell. His brown eyes remained fixed onto hers. He was determined not to look away. He watched her and she watched him. There was such intention in her gaze that he wondered why she had ventured towards the back of the liquor shop at all. Her smell had drawn him to her. But what had been her pursuit? The two pairs of eyes remained locked. But no one noticed this. Not a single person disturbed the beginning of whatever this would become. But if from the front of the shop anyone had looked back, they would have found two children, not far in each from each other, clinging to opposite <coughs> sides of an old glass cabinet full of perfume bottles. Fidos! Altaf's voice called out from the front of the shop, causing her to look away. Fitos. Samir repeated under his breath, savoring the name. Fitos. Valentine's. Of course, <coughs> she had to be. Mm, that's lovely. That's really lovely. So, um, why does partition? Why are you so obsessed with yeah. partition? Yeah. <laughs> such a long shadow uh, on your writing. So maybe you'd also tell us a bit about your family history and influences and what has brought you to this path. That's a shorter shadow than many other writers have written about partition for decades, but I'm getting there. Uh, I, I began writing about partition at quite a young age, uh, at younger even than I am now. Mm -hmm. uh, at the age of 23, so exactly 10 years ago. And it was only because I didn't actually know anything about my own history, uh, my family's history. And both sides of my family come from what is now Pakistan. All four of my grandparents' families are from different parts. Uh, my mother's family is here. They are originally from Lahore. Uh, my father's family, his father came from... Uh, uh, near Raul Pindi and his mother came from Dera Ismail Khan to the all different parts of Pakistan and they carried of course they carried so many intangibles with them and they stayed in refugee camps, Kingsway camp in Delhi um, different parts of the old city and I don't think any of them really ever wanted to talk about it they didn't actually have the luxury to discuss it because especially for my paternal grandparents who were living in the camp, the, the need was to feed the family. So to get a job, to have money, to feed the family, and the next day the same thing again and again. And so there was never really any desire to think about what had been left behind because everyone around you had been through the same thing. But when you're growing up as a child in a big metropolis like Delhi where you have your own interests and pursuits, and not just for me, I would say like my mother's generation as well. Uh, you know, my Masi is sitting here, I don't know how much she asked her parents about partition. I really didn't know anything. I didn't know anything to a point that I didn't even know where my family had come from because, you know, it's not like Pakistan. Pakistan, you know that the country was created at partition. So in a way, you learn not to take that for granted. 
in India, it's very easy to actually ignore the concept of partition, also because much of the country didn't experience it. For a lot of the country, it was independence. So at the age of 23, when I was in a master's program, I found, or rather I was introduced to two old objects that uh, my mother's family had carried from Lahore to Amritsar. And there were such ordinary things, but there was a ghara in which lassi is made and a gulz. And um, I, just, I just wondered why, why they carried those things. The ghara, of course, because lassi was made every Sunday. So lassi had to be made every Sunday. And a gulz because they were clothing merchants. Gulls, they had a clothing gulls. shop in an Arpili Bazaar, which is where <coughs> the religious clothing shop comes from. And uh, I was so removed from that world that when I saw the girls, I had to ask Nani, kya hai? Because I didn't know, you know. Um, so that was the beginning of my interest in partition. What were the things that people carried? Why did they carry those things? Louder. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? When you speak, Speak to the audience. Okay. Okay. I will project my voice, yeah. even though it's very unnatural for me. <laughs> so uh, I started thinking, of course, of the objects, and through that, whether we could think about the experiences of people, because to ask about partition still felt so um, intrusive. That to say, oh, you carried this ring, how interesting, why did you carry this ring? And then why didn't you sell this ring? if you carried it to yeah. be able to sell it. So I think the stories of survival that came out of that and the stories of longing were quite um, at loggerheads with the stories of violence we had always heard. I was, I was discussing with you outside why stories of violence are the first things we hear. And I think when you speak to people of that generation, there will be violence, but it's more complicated than that. It's not so easy to say that everything was bad and everyone killed everyone. Because somewhere in that narration will be, oh, but our neighbors were like this. Or, you know, I ate this. I really remember that train station. Achha, I remember that post office. You know, like there was always these little tributaries of stories that people would tell. And this is why oral history was so vital because no academic text uh, firstly, they don't give it enough importance, but these are the stories that we pass down in our family. So why are they not written? Uh, and of course, when we think of the formal archive, we think of something that's in a library, that's written down, usually uh, by a victor. In this case, it are, there are a lot of British archives. But I found myself realizing that that was one version of the truth. Now, these family stories are another version of it. So I wrote a book on objects that people carried during partition. And then I wrote a second book about how partition memory is passed down the generations and why it is important to look at how it has been passed down. Has silence been passed down? Has hatred been passed down? Um, is partition relevant? Should we talk about it? How does it impact us? Does it impact our qualities as who we are as families? Does it impact our habits? Uh, why do we not know the languages that our ancestors used to speak? Simple habits like grandparents hoarding food, parents not wanting to throw anything away, uh, certain foods uh, associated to certain traumatic memories. These are all things that can in part be linked to an event like partition. So I did interviews across India, Pakistan and Bangladesh and then while working on that second book, I was working on this novel. And I think it was only because I spent so much time in the realm of partition that I could write this novel. Because it really requires you to be familiar with every aspect of that event, whether it is psychological, physical, the violence, the friendship, the uprootedness, the longing, the anger, you know, the disloyalty, uh, or loyalty for that matter. And uh, I think that I needed history and my immersion in that to write this. Uh, that being said, I am taking a break from writing about partition. It's been 10 years and it's very difficult to constantly um, immerse yourself in other people's sadness 
on an everyday basis. So I'm taking a short break on this subject. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Nazi because I think she's got many questions, especially on the book. From the book. Yeah. So the two main characters, mm -hmm. Samir and Pradhos, one a perfumer and second a calligrapher. Mm -hmm. So how did these two arts came in your mind that you could you know, write about these two arts? Mm -hmm. Can you hear or should we ask now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, calligraphy, um, calligraphy I think came from my own history. I I write non-fiction books and, and novels but I'm trained as a metal engraver and a printer Very and nice. I, thank you, <laughs> though I haven't done it for many years but you know things like paper making, book making, calligraphy, letterpress, these are all things that I was very well versed in. And calligraphy, particularly Urdu calligraphy, which is what the Lord does, um, is dying as an art. There's hardly any people that can even teach you how to hold a kalam for that matter, you know, let alone uh, write it. So uh, I was very interested in honoring that. Uh, also, to make a female calligrapher is is an interesting thing because at the time, and Wazir Khan was well the novel is set. She started at a very young age. Yes, and there were no female calligraphers, so it required a lot of research with people who had done research on calligraphy to create this uh, forward-thinking father who uh, propagated this interest in a forward-thinking daughter. The aspect of perfumery was something that I didn't know anything about. Um, there are not a lot of novels that focus on how our senses dictate our actions, at least in Indian literature. There are many in the world, the most famous being, of course, Patrick Suskin's perfume. But to have, you know, the sense of smell is so intrinsic to the South Asian identity. Smell evokes memory. Smell gives pleasure. If tomorrow we cannot smell, we won't enjoy anything. How many people lost their sense of smell during COVID? It's so alarming. You don't know whether food is bad. You don't know whether you've cooked something that smells good or not, you can't tell. And then of course you associate smell with people. You open a trunk, something yeah. smells of your grandmother. Yeah. You open, I don't know, your mother's perfume box. Jasmine reminds you of her, you know. Uh, naphthalene balls, smells of old shawls. I can go on and on, you know. Um, smell it. COVID and sanitizers. A COVID and sanitizers, <laughs> yeah. A terrible spectrum of smell. But yeah, it, it links to your memory, and yet it is such an esoteric realm that we don't have enough vocabulary to write about it. Um, I said before my Masi sitting here, she's heard me tell this story tons of times, so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but her father, my Nana, is just like an extraordinary person. He used to work as a chemist for Dabur. And he used to, and this is a story that my mother told to me, like in passing. Now these sisters, now they have these stories and they don't share them. Mm -hmm. And then randomly one day they'll say, oh, by the way, my mother used to do this beautiful thing. And you as a writer are thinking, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I was talking to my mother. She told me the story of how when her father was working as a chemist at Darbur, he would, um, his job was to make soaps and shampoos, and so he would get essences, papaya, uh, aloe vera, jasmine, rose, and then like really random things like mogambo and, you know, fruit punch. Alag -alag samples used to come to him. And he used to use them in his soaps and shampoos and creams. And then whatever he didn't use, he would bring home. And in the summertime, in the cooler, he would put Kass. the water. Yeah. He would put yeah. the water. So Kass. one day, the room would smell of khas. Mm. The other day, it would smell of rose. And that story was so beautiful. And I think that act of one person going out of their way to create a kind of garden of the cave for the entire family, so the whole house smells beautiful and perfumed. It really moved me a lot. And um, it gave
gave me the idea <coughs> of one of the main characters for the book. Uh, so much so that he looks like him and acts like him and his behavior is like him as well. So um, that's where perfumery and calligraphy came from. So you've written in detail about perfumeries and all. From where did you do your research? How? I've never read about perfumery in so much detail. So glad. Um, but there are books. Yeah, they're often quite academic though, and uh, it's often for other perfumers. Yeah. Uh, I shadowed different perfumers over the course of five years because it's not just how a perfumer makes a perfume, which in itself, you know, how does a flower become liquid is so bizarre to me. There is a whole process of distillation, which is different in our part of the world than mm -hmm. it is in the West. So those were two things that I wanted to learn. I worked with a perfumer in Paris and I work with perfumers in Kannauj. Because I think the associations to perfume, like in the East, in our part of the world, we associate perfume to so many sacred, mythical mm -hmm. things. You know, of course, it is so nostalgic as well. And the history of perfume in the West has been from everything, from smelling great to hiding unwashed bodies. And the connotation also of that history is very yeah. different. Mm -hmm. uh, as are the methods of distillation. You know, we essentially in Kannauj use the same method uh, that we have since ancient times of uh, copper cylinders and deg uh, bhapka with water and cooling. Uh, so it does have such an ancestry attached to that because people that do that have done it for generations. So uh, I could never understand enough about perfume by myself. I needed the help of other people. To, to be able to write about it accurately. And Fildos's father was very supportive of her relationship with Samir. Yeah. Do you really think in that era, fathers were supportive? Because whenever we think it is usually the mothers who support their daughters. Hmm. Interesting. And just the, this thing of Pai Fildos and Samir and the different communities, because that's yeah. the beginning of it. Right. Um, so I was asked this question, I've been asked this question multiple times, ke, one of your characters is Muslim, the other one is Hindu. Are you making a statement in today's time? Love Jihad. Love Jihad. Right. Uh, I didn't want to say that, but here it is. Uh, actually, it was not that uncommon for multiple religions to fraternize with each other, whether it is friendship or affection or um, you have a crush on someone, you go as so far as to date someone. Because I had heard stories like that from people I interviewed. And they weren't like, um, I mean, they weren't like the passionate love stories we have today where we went on dates and stuff. But, you know, there were people that said, I used to write letters to a girl. Mm -hmm. And there was something she sublime. moved away. And I thought about her a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and, and you'll find these stories in my books. Uh, I remember there was a gentleman whose son told me this story, he's from Dhaka, he told me a story of his father who was Muslim. Uh, he fell in love with a girl who was Hindu. They were also 10, 12 years old at the time of partition. He says that we never told each other anything, but we knew that we liked each other. Partition happened, he stayed in uh, what became East Pakistan and then Bangladesh, she moved to West Bengal. And he says, 25 years later, a letter comes from my father, from this woman saying, uh, my father has died. And now I'm by myself. I've inherited his fortune. Please come, I'm waiting for you. You don't need to reply, just come. Huh? These are real stories and they sound like movies. Um, another story I heard where... Um, Did he go? <laughs> yeah, that's another story. <laughs> he thought about it. And you know, his son is telling me this story. So it's complicated already for his son to think of his father thinking of another woman. Uh, but it's not uncommon. I think WhatsApp has got some of these stories and you have people who have filmed this stuff, exactly right. this stuff, right. and it's been circulating on This is not a WhatsApp story. This is, this is a real story. Uh, he thought about it definitely and then he decided not to go. And his oh. son is looking for the woman so still. Wow. And he thinks that she may have died already but he's still looking for her. Because he wants to know what his father was like at that age. So it's, it's from this is where you got the inspiration no. for Samir Khan? No, no, not at all. I'm just telling you that um, these stories are real. They are not 
you know, you may think that that time was more conservative, but uh, nothing is black or white. You will hear many complicated, very modern stories from your parents and grandparents of that time. Um, but yes, Altaf, who is Fidoz's father, is unusually modern because he wants, he's educated his daughter, which already goes against the grain of someone yes. from his community. And he wants her to have a life beyond the walls of his calligraphy studio which is why he says he, she's the first person to go to college. She's the first woman to go to college from his family. And he sees the modernity in Samir's family, and he sees the future she could have. So while he doubts, am I doing the right thing, he thinks about it many times, he does go along with it because she feels like a different person. Firdaus feels like a different person than Samir, someone that has a um, future beyond what he may be able to give her. And whereas, you know, her, her mother, Firdaus's mother, Zainab, louder. Firdaus's uh, mother, Zainab, is the one character which I think uh, is the realest character in the book. Because while her husband, Altaf, is so supportive of Firdaus, um, going to college, having this romance with this boy, Samir, she tells him, I have told you to tell this will end badly. And in that sense, she is the most foresighted person to see what partition can do. You know, uh, I, I think sometimes if I met her in person, she wouldn't like me because I gave her an, a villainous arc. Yes, and even I didn't like her. <laughs> but you know, she been a bit supportive. No, the story I, would but have I think she's, it's, it, it makes the character real. You know, it makes the character real. Yeah. You can't have two supportive yeah. parents because they're up for yeah. you. Know? You could, but but how could you think of such a love story in today's time where the meaning of love has changed in the world of Tinder, Instagram? But mm -hmm. has it changed? Like, yes, it has. But what do we want when we love someone? We, we want tenderness, we want faithfulness, we want loyalty and honesty. But all these things are missing. Now it is. Yeah, I mean, I think if you talk about the truth today, yeah. all these things are missing. There is no loyalty. They are chatting to five people at one time. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm single. No, I don't know. Uh, I can't say. But I don't think the essence of love has changed. Maybe the manner in which we show it or the frivolity with which we discard it has changed. But in that moment when you think that you love someone or you are in love with someone, I, I don't think it's. I mean, it's, it's a human emotion, right? It, millions of people have felt it for centuries and they will continue to, and we can't explain it. That's the thing. We can't really explain why we do certain things when we are in love. And uh, I, Yeah, I would disagree. I don't think the essence is changed. Maybe just the manner in which we find it, we, we discard it. I don't know. Like I said, I'm single, so I'm not the best spokesperson for this question. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, Similarly, I think you should not take love as a single entity. Yeah, it's not so many shades. So I think uh, all shades are yeah. acceptable. Correct. Yeah, I think so as well. Yeah. So why did you choose so many stories together, World War, then Vivek's story? It was itself a very good story. And then Samir, Partition, so many to stories together in one book. You just need a good, big, fat historical novel. From a young, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> It felt like a very natural thing because if you think about it, so many families of Punjab went through, like you would never doubt if this was someone's family history. You were speaking to someone and they said, well, I had an uncle that went to the First World War, then my father went to the Second World War, <coughs> then we also experienced Jallianwala Bagh, we also experienced partition. It's very common for families to have all those histories yes. in a single yes. family. Yes. It's not uncommon, so then it's in a book. Why does it feel like a lot? It's not. It's just a reflection of our history. It's a very, like, it's a very uniquely Punjabi thing. We are martial races. We did go to war. We did experience partition. We did lose at partition. Some some gained. But these are, we have that history in our ancestry already. Now you're just writing it chronologically. It feels like a lot, which should make you think that. Our histories are also a lot. Our histories to inherit this is a lot. To make sense of this is a lot. To make sense of how we feel about warfare is a lot. 
for soldiers to fight with one another and then against one another after partition is also a lot. Mm. So it is just a reflection of a Punjabi family's story. Uh, it's just written chronologically, so it feels, and it, it charts a person's life from birth to death also. That's why. <laughs> So my last question, I don't want to give any spoilers, but when I just uh, read the last page, it just came in my mind that if I ever meet you, I'll be asking you this question, did you think of any alternate ending or this was the only thing you thought? Um, I never thought of an alternate ending. No, never? No. So this, I, this I'll talk about this outside, not here, in front of everyone. <laughs> Muslim but this is something you know a reader really wants in the end. See, I I understand where you're coming from, and maybe a little bit of a spoiler is fine that they you don't please. ultimately need to buy it. You must all buy it. Yeah, you 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 Samir and Fridos after many years after being separated from partition don't meet. Uh sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> but that's reality. That's the reality. But if reality. Samir Khan could go, why could Fridos go? Sometimes, when you imagine something in your life that is so beautiful that has happened to you, you don't think reality will match up to it. Yes, Which is why a lot of people after partition don't want to go back to where they came from because they don't think it will ever match up to what it was like. And it's right. Life has changed. Uh, the house of the past is most beautiful because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It exists only in memory, in fantasy, in nostalgia. And it's kind of like a house made of smoke. You can add to it. It's, it's not going to be there. So I spoke to too many people that um, did not want to revisit what they had left behind. Similarly, I think both Samir and Fridaz uh, are afraid. Yes. Samir says it quite frankly. He says, don't find her because if she has married, if she has children, if she has gone on with her life, a life without me, then I wouldn't be able to bear it. In that case, my image of her in my dreams when we are together is real too. Thank you so much, What you just said actually always, I mean, this is something my mother has been saying to us constantly because they also came away from Abbottabad. And uh, she never wanted to go back. And the time that my dad and she did go once, uh, after he'd retired and everything, um, she went back to look at the house and she just hated it. Because the house seemed so much smaller. It was all painted green. There was a bus stop, like a large bus stop in front of the house. Yeah. There were milling people. She yeah. didn't remember that. Yeah. The garden or whatever else they had. So it was really quite a shock. I mean, and on the flip side, there are aspects where people go and they have a great time where yes. they are welcomed by the families yes. in India or Pakistan. But I think you are taking a chance. Mm. You know, exactly. you're taking a chance both ways. But I want you also to talk a little bit about this museum of material memory ah. because of both the things, the material and the memory mm. and what connects, right. the two connect and then how it connects with us. Well, the simplest way to say it is that an object is just an object. It has, uh, it cannot speak, it cannot feel mm -hmm. until we infuse it there with memory. Yeah. Huh? There are stories in bottles. Well, yeah, but a yeah. uh, bottle is just a bottle until you put a memory into it, right? Uh, so as I was doing research for my first book, I came across a lot of stories uh, in different parts of not just India, but Pakistan, Bangladesh that I couldn't go to that actually extended a lot beyond partition as well. Someone would say, I have this handkerchief that my great-grandmother uh, embroidered in the 1800s. I have this sewing machine, uh, but I haven't witnessed partition. Can you come to our homes and take photos and talk about these objects as I was doing for partition objects? And I started thinking of how associations with objects, family objects, are how especially younger people learn about their family histories because it is a lot easier to ask your family about an object and understand their history through that than to ask questions that you don't know how to navigate. 
which is what I was doing with partition. I didn't understand partition, so I was using the aid of objects to enter people's family histories. So uh, along with a friend, I created uh, an online museum. And the reason why it's online is because it encompasses all of South Asia. And doing it either in Delhi or in Lahore or in Dhaka or something feels unfair. So to make it online means to make it accessible and equal. Uh, about stories of objects that we have in our homes in South Asia that define a certain time and uh, tell a certain family story. And the museum is called the Museum of Material Memory, looking at the memory infused within materiality and uh, just the unlikely stories that emerge from objects. You know, so I remember we did a story once about a uh, so we have this in Punjabi homes also to cut uh, sag, the one with the big... That's three daughters. Okay. So you know what I'm saying. There's a big yeah. blade and there's sickle a... Sickle-like. Yeah, sickle-like. Uh, a woman from South India did a story where she wrote about a specific kind of thing they have to cut coconuts. Mm -hmm. We posted that online. People from everywhere, not just India, but Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka said, Oh, we have this in our house and we use it to cut fish only. We have this in our house, we only use it to cut saag. Okay, we cut this kind of fruit, we cut, you know, so I feel like stories, they have no, they are borderless, firstly, they are an equalizer in a way, they have no nationality, they have no religion, and they are able to bring people together, together in the most virtual sense of the word, but if, you're, if someone from Karachi is reading a story about someone from Dhaka and saying, you know, I have the same thing in my house. How interesting. What do you use it for? Yes. It's a way to bridge gaps without even um, really consciously thinking that you're doing it, which your national history sometimes does not allow you to do. Uh, the other thing that really uh, I enjoyed very much in the book, and I think it's also rather unusual the way you've used it, is that diary. And all those things about World War I, which, uh, as you said earlier, uh, in India we really know very little. Uh, what was the contribution of Indian soldiers in, in that uh, First World War, where they went, what happened to them. Uh, maybe, you know, great-grandfathers or whatever, grandfathers, you may have heard some stories from them, but there's really very little written account. Mm -hmm. So I found that very fascinating. And for you to have used that as uh, such a sizable uh, It's So a just talk a bit about yeah, that. Yeah, um, one of the reasons why I focused, so there are two major landscapes of the book. One is partition and what happens after partition, and one is the First World War, which really defines Samir's understanding of his uncle Vivek who went to fight in the war because uh, like many of us, Samir doesn't know that India had anything to do with the war. And he doesn't understand what perfumers do in a war. His uncle Vivek is a perfumer. What do perfumers do on a battlefield? So later in life, when he's an adult, he uncovers Vivek's journals from the war that Vivek very religiously kept because he was one of the few um, literate people in the army because at the time, it was an illiterate army, but it was not a non-literary army. So they were very poetic. They did, you know, gazelle and all, and they could they could speak, but they could not write. So a lot of the letters written, uh, Indians were writing something like 15,000 letters a week when they first went to the war in, uh, in Flanders, in what is now Belgium. And they were writing all these letters by narrating them to scribes. So Vivek in the novel goes goes to war as a part of the Lahore division. He goes to Flanders and he gets appointed as the scribe because he's an educated man. He can write. <coughs> and predictably enough, all these people start telling him stories. Mm -hmm. What are these stories? Can you write um, to my parents in Rajasthan about the fish that I saw flying in the ocean? They've never seen fish. They've never seen water. For so many of these people that came from landlocked villages, they had never mm -hmm. seen a body of water. You know? Um, can you write to my mother to send my shahinai? Can you write to my brother to say, is that battle for that, uh, that property battle for that field still going on? 
know, these are the things that they're writing about. They're writing that we see women working here. We see dogs working, we see cows working in the field. They, they understand a sense of modernity, these Indian soldiers, and many of them, if they come back, apply it to their lives as well. Um, but how do we know what they wrote and how they felt and the words that they used? We know because we still have these letters. It's a very complicated source, though, because these letters were narrated to a scribe, Katib, and then the British censor male translated them to English to read what the Indian soldiers were writing. It's mm -hmm. common practice amongst mm -hmm. the Commonwealth, not just India, because they wanted to make sure they weren't giving away coordinates or something about the war. And then things were retracted. This cannot go, this cannot go, this can go. So what we have is a version of a letter that's actually quite far removed, not just in its language, but also its intention from the original. We don't know the words they used. We don't know the feelings they had. We know what they said in a, in a tongue that's not theirs. Mm -hmm. It's in the colonizer's tongue. We're reading it in English. So to reference these letters means to, in a way, translate in your mind what they may have said in their Urdu, Gurmukhi, Garwali, Gujarati, Marathi, Hindi at the time. And they're really quite heartbreaking as well, you know. They compare the war to Mahabharat, they compare it to Karbala. You learn about uh, the different camps of soldiers. The Muslims had different kitchen, Hindu Sikhs had different kitchen. But you also learn about how they saved each other on the battlefields. You learn about their families, writing to them saying that if you die on the battlefield, you will be as eternal as the sun. You will do our family proud. Mm -hmm. And so Vivek is learning about all these things. And then decades later, Samir is learning about all these things and understanding a landscape of war that he's just so unfamiliar with. Because he has just witnessed partition and he can't understand. Will a Hindu and a Sikh and a Muslim and a Christian and a Parsi ever sit together again? Will we ever be able to have a discussion again? Because partition has just happened. Um, it's, um, there's really nothing written about the soldiers. In fact, not enough people, even 1.5 million soldiers is what we contributed uh, in manpower. But there's so much more in terms of resources, animals that India as, uh, as a colony gave. And people only came to know really about this contribution in 2014 during the centenary of the war. Mm. And uh, I wanted younger people, I always want younger people to ask questions in their families after reading my books. But I really wanted them to ask uh, in their houses whether they had any war contribution, and if not, whether they remembered what was happening mm. during that time in their home. Because, you know, war at the home front is also very interesting. See, wife unko likhni hai ki tumne mujhe apni saas ke saath yahan itne saal chhod diya hai you know like what am i going to do with her you bet you better come back you better not die there there are things like this you know so it's uh, it was very interesting uh, resource to spend time with so much time with thank you i'm going to stop here and uh, we'll take two questions so and then get on to the next part of our program yeah pichika please so uh, from what i gather is there's a large canvas for a love story yes and you just said that you being single are not the right person to talk about love. How does that even equate? I mean, I feel different kinds of love. I feel love for my family. Yeah. I feel love. So that is love. Of course it's love. I just don't know a romantic kind of love. But I don't think that's the only kind of love. So if you've not felt that, how could you write it and bring it in? I depended how a lot on the reason? stories that were told to me. Like, um, love can emerge in the most unlikely scenarios. My grandparents met at a refugee camp. They fell in love. That's such an unusual story. I would have never imagined that. Um, and I think there is something to be said about a kind of old-fashioned love that we all know about, that we all maybe... More um, romantic. More romantic, more like simpler. I think simpler. Something that's just about like Soul. Sure. Soul. Sure. But like like she said, you know, Ash, like there's just so much tinder sugar. Yes, it's not here. Um but it's it's difficult to find love, it's even harder to hold on to it, I think. You know? But I just missed the word. 
I say it's, it's difficult, difficult to find, find and harder to hold on to it. Harder to hold on. And um, I suppose constantly um, you have to work on it to be attractive. Right, right. Um, I don't know if I've done justice by writing about it, but you have to read it. I don't know. Thank you. But I don't think it matters whether you are in love or not. Like, I'm not a soldier. I'm writing a soldier story. Uh, I'm not Pakistani. I'm writing from a Pakistani perspective. I am uh, not a perfumer, not a calligrapher. I'm none of these things. But I'm impressed by the way you said you shall with perfumers for a certain Yes, time. yes, of course, five years. Yeah. You know, long period, of time. long period of time because it's not just how they smell or make things; it's how they uh, exist in a world that is constantly assaulting them with smell. You know how they clear a track and for themselves. Yes. Yeah, of course. Very nice. Thank you. Any other question? Only times the love was bonding between the soul and admiration. Today, in today's time, it is all physical. You know. They imagine it as love, that's all in infatuation and physical. I don't know. The meaning of love <laughs> I don't know. I can't so say. what I know, the meaning of love is very different today. Where it was then. Admiration. Well, well, in Guwahati, connect. it's still debatable. No, it is. It's still debatable. Those days, you should read Patashio. You should read Patashio. You should read those days. You should read Patashio. You should read the Chaucer's Tales. Right. Physical love is as much. Yes. I know you need brand level. Yeah, you need brand level. No. He's talking about physical love only. Things are totally out of control. Ah. Love is something you know. It is not that bonding, that soul bonding, that you know, admiration for one another. You see, my newly married cousin and her, my brother-in-law are here. Maybe I'll uh, you know. I don't put on the spot. They just got married like six months ago. And, uh, What do children do? I am in love in so and so. Get married or run away, and after two years, divorce. Why? Love's finished, lost. You know? I don't know. Those days were so different. So I'm telling you. By the way, in so many examples, love was so divine, such a beautiful emotion. But the world was also. It was a beautiful emotion. Yeah. No. But the world is different. I think every couple is different. very conservative. I am. But. Then and now, the vast difference between what it was and what it is now. Of course. With most things, including onion yes. prices. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And they keep we all going with onions and tomatoes. tomatoes. Love jihad, what is it now? Tell me. Earlier, you Hindu question. married a Sikh, Sikh married a Muslim. Something something it was all together. Uh -huh. I was. Yes. Anji. No, I was just wondering if this is a learned audience. I yes. just wanted to know something from them. Not exactly from you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But, but Fantastic. It is something to Question do with partitions. Yes. Uh, we have lots of people uh, who migrated from India to mm -hmm. Pakistan and they became like, you know, very famous artists there. Names like, you know, even Ashpak Kano is there and Frida Khan there and Faz went from here and lots of other names. Mm -hmm. Kazmi mm -hmm. went from here and they, they became big names there. Uh, are there any big names to the audience? Who migrated from Pakistan and became big names in this country? Who? 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 I'd like to read about yeah, those, those authors yeah, who have migrated from Pakistan and they kind of talk about. Uh, um, there are very few of them, I think. Actually, in my first book, I have a chapter on uh, <clears throat> this uh, very famous Punjabi poet, Prabhjot Kaur that not enough people knew about. She's translated in hundreds of languages, like I think... Of course uh, we know her, yes. You know her here mm -hmm. in yes, Amritsar, yes. but uh, no, not enough people know about her. So, unki kaha ni mene pehle kitab. Just be Jan ki sister, I won't look. Correct, correct, right. Yeah, she's a right. sister. No, like yeah, and she had interesting stories to tell about how partition impacted her writing process <laughs> after migration. Yeah. So, um, 
we carry on now to the next part of the program, which is supposed to be a bit of a surprise for everybody since we didn't reveal what we were doing. <laughs> so from uh, yes, Archer's uh, beautifully etched characters and their love story. Oh, is this which, a quiz for me? No, oh, it's called. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> no, but you will win it. Hands which, down. You'd be surprised. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Which begins in Lahore. Uh, in Undivided Punjab to another timeless love story which we are all familiar with. Punjab's well-known, well-loved writer Amrita Pritam and her companion Imros. Imros. So we'll have Jasmeet Nayar and Arinda Chamak, seasoned actors and performers, both of them. And they're going to recreate for us a small wow. slice of Amrita and Imros. Wow. 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 That is the tradition of let's believe in love. I would be needing my chair. <laughs> okay, so we should. We need to put these lights on for you. I was wondering since the time come here, at Kaki, is it to create the ambience? Yes. Oh, oh, let us. Oh, it was a place. I think we can. Let us. Can you switch up all the other lights? ਕਿਉਂ ਬੁਲਾ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਹਾਂ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਮੇਰੀ ਉਮਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਮੁਰਦੀ 
ਨਹੀਂ ਪਈ ਉਮਰ ਦਿਲ ਦਾ ਸਾਥ ਨਹੀਂ ਦਿੰਦੀ ਦਿਲ ਉਸੇ ਥਾਂ ਖਲੋ ਗਿਆ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਤੂੰ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਖਲੋਣ ਦਾ ਇਸ਼ਾਰਾ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੱਚ ਉਹਦੇ ਪੈਰ ਉੱਥੇ ਖਲੋਤੇ ਪਏ ਨੇ ਪਰ ਅੱਜ ਕੱਲ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਇੱਕ ਦਿਨ ਵੀ ਕਈ ਕਈ ਵਰੇ ਬੀਤੇ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਉਮਰ ਦੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਵਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਪਾਰ ਮਿੱਤੋਂ ਸਹਾਇਆ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਜ਼ਾਲਮ ਇੱਕ ਵਾਰ ਆਵਾਜ਼ ਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਕੇ ਦੇ ਇੱਕ ਵਾਰ ਆਵਾਜ਼ ਦੇ ਦੇ ਕਿ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੇ ਕੋਲ ਲੈ ਜਾ ਤੂੰ ਮੇਰੀ ਕਿਸਮਤ ਹੈ ਮੈਂ ਸਿਰਫ ਇਸ ਆਵਾਜ਼ ਨੂੰ ਉਡੀਕ ਰਿਹਾ ਹਾਂ ਵਕਤ ਉਡੀਕ ਰਿਹਾ ਹਾਂ ਮੇਰਾ ਹਾਲ ਉਡੀਕ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਮੇਰਾ ਮੁਸਤਕਬਲ ਉਡੀਕ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਇੱਕ ਆਵਾਜ਼ ਦੇ ਮੈਂ ਸਭ ਕੁਝ ਪੇਟ ਕਰ ਲਿਆ ਕਰਾਂ ਕੱਲ 1960 ਦੀ ਮੇਰੀ ਤਕਦੀਰ ਸੁਣ ਇਹ ਰਾਜਨ ਦੀ ਹੋਣ ਇਸ ਧਰਤੀ ਤੇ ਕੋਈ ਨਹੀਂ ਉਹ ਤਾਂ ਸਿਰਫ ਮੇਰੇ ਸੁਪਨੇ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲਿਆ ਹੋਇਆ ਸੀ ਅੱਜ ਜਿਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਤੂੰ ਅਸ਼ੂ ਪੜ ਕੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਫੋਨ ਕੀਤਾ ਤੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਮੈਂ ਤੇਰਾ ਰਾਜਨ ਬੋਲ ਰਿਹਾ ਉਸ ਦਿਨ ਧਰਤੀ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਬਣ ਗਈ ਇਸ ਗੱਲ ਨੇ ਕਰਮ ਵੀ ਕੀਤਾ ਤੇ ਕਹਿਰ ਵੀ ਕੀਤਾ ਮੇਰੀ ਨਜ਼ਰ ਨੇ ਤੇਰੀ ਨਜ਼ਰ ਨੇ ਮੇਰੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਪਿਆ ਵਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਕੋਰਾ ਝਾੜ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਇਹ ਨਜ਼ਰ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਮਜਬੂਰ ਹਾਲਤਾਂ 'ਚ ਮੇਰੇ ਕੋਲ ਨਿਖੜੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਅਹਿਸਾਸ ਹੈ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਪਰ ਜਦੋਂ ਇਹ ਨਜ਼ਰ ਮੇਰੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਫੇਰ ਆਏਗੀ ਤਾਂ ਮੇਰੇ ਮਨ ਦਾ ਰੰਗ ਸੁਹਾ ਹੋ ਜਾਏਗਾ ਤੇਰੀ ਬੇਗਮ ਮੇਰੀ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਅੱਜ ਇੱਕ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤੀ ਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਖਾਤੀ ਹੈ ਇੱਕ ਹੁਸੀਨਾ ਦਾ ਹਸੀਨ ਪੈਗਾਮ ਇਹ ਜਨਮ ਦਿਨ ਇਹ ਖਤ ਇਹ ਮੇਰਾ ਨਾਜ਼ ਹੈ ਤੂੰ ਤੂੰ ਮੇਰੇ ਜੀਵਨ ਦਾ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਫਰੀਬ ਵੀ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਹਕੀਕਤ ਹੈ ਗੱਲ ਨੇਪਾਲ ਦੀ ਹੈ ਨੇਪਾਲ ਦਾ ਕਵੀ ਸੰਮੇਲਨ ਮੇਰੇ ਵਿਸ਼ਵਾਸ ਤੇਰੇ ਮਿਲਣ ਨਾਲ ਮੇਰੀ ਕਲਮ ਦੀ ਚਿੰਗ ਤਾਂ ਸ਼ੋਲਾ ਪੜ ਗਈ ਕੱਲ ਨੇਪਾਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਸ ਕਲਮੀ ਅੱਗ ਨੂੰ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੇ ਫੁੱਲਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਸਤਕਾਰਿਆ ਤੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਫੁੱਲ ਮਿਲੇ ਸੀ ਮੈਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਤੇ ਯਾਦ ਨੂੰ ਚੜਾ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਅਮਰਤਾ ਰਾਤ ਦੇ 2 ਵਜੇ ਤੇਰੇ ਬਗੈਰ ਇੰਜ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਜੀਵਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਈ ਦੌਲਤ ਪੂਰੀ ਨਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਗਰੀਬ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਤੂੰ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਮਝਦਾ ਮੇਰੀ ਇਹ ਦੌਲਤ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਜਿੰਨੀ ਖਰਚੀ ਜਾਊ ਉਹਨੀ ਜੀਵਨ ਦੇ ਖਰਚ ਲਈ ਹੈ ਆ ਆ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਜੇ ਦਾ ਨੋਟ ਬਣਾ ਦੇ ਮੈਂ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਫੇਰ ਮਿਲਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਫੇਰ ਮਿਲਾਂਗੀ ਕਿੱਥੇ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਪਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਸ਼ਾਇਰ ਤੇਰੇ ਤਖਈਲ ਦੀ ਚਿਣਕ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਤੇਰੀ ਕੈਨਵਸ ਉੱਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਰਹੱਸਮਈ ਲਕੀਰ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਖਾਮੋਸ਼ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਤਕਦੀਰ ਹਾਂਗੀ ਜਾਂ ਖੋਰੇ ਮੈਂ ਸੂਰਜ ਦੀ ਕਲੋ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਤੇਰੇ ਰੰਗਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਭੁਲਾਂਗੀ ਤੇ ਰੰਗਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਬਾਹਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੈਠ ਕੇ ਤੇਰੀ ਕੈਨਵਸ ਨੂੰ ਬਲਾਂਗੀ ਪਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਕਿੱਥੇ ਪਰ ਮੈਂ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਮਿਲਾਂਗੀ ਜਾਂ ਖੋਰੇ ਮੈਂ ਕਿ ਚਸ਼ਮਾ ਬਣੀ ਹੋਵਾਂਗੀ ਤੇ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਚਰਨਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਪਾਣੀ ਉੱਠਦਾ ਹੈ ਮੈਂ ਪਾਣੀ ਦੀਆਂ ਬੂੰਦਾਂ ਤੇਰੇ ਪਿੰਡੇ ਤੇ ਮਲਾਂਗੀ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਠੰਡਕ ਜਿਹੀ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਤੇਰੀ ਛਾਤੀ ਨਾਲ ਲੱਗਾਂਗੀ ਮੈਂ ਹੋਰ ਕੁਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾਣਦੀ ਬਸ ਇੰਨਾ ਜਾਣਦੀ ਆ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਜਿਸਮ ਮੁੱਕਦਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਸਭ ਕੁਝ ਮੁੱਕ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਪਰ ਵਕਤ ਜੋ ਵੀ ਹੋਏਗਾ ਮੇਰੇ ਨਾਲ ਤੁਰੇਗਾ ਸੁਣੋ
ਇਹਨਾਂ ਧਾਗਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਫਿਰ ਬਲਾਂਗੀ ਮੈਂ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਫਿਰ ਬਲਾਂਗੀ ਮੈਂ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਫਿਰ ਬਲਾਂਗੀ ਮੇਰੀ ਪ੍ਰੀ ਤਸਵੁਰ ਦੀ ਖਿੜਕੀ ਚੋਂ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਦੇਖ ਰਿਹਾ ਤੂੰ ਖਾਮੋਸ਼ੀ ਨੀਵੀ ਪਾਈ ਤੂੰ ਤਾਂ ਉਦੋਂ ਵੀ ਮੇਰੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਗੱਲਾਂ ਕਰ ਲੈਂਦੀ ਸੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਜਦੋਂ ਮੈਂ ਤੇਰਾ ਕੁਝ ਵੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਹੁਣ ਤਾਂ ਹਾਂ ਹੁਣ ਤਾਂ ਤੇਰਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਕੁਝ ਹੈ ਜਨਮ ਤੋਂ ਤੇਰਾ ਸਾਰਾ ਆਪਣਾ ਸਿਰਫ ਕੁਝ ਦਿਨਾਂ ਤੋਂ ਕੁਝ ਗਿਆ ਇਹ ਖਾਮੋਸ਼ੀ ਵੀ ਇਹ ਖਾਮੋਸ਼ੀ ਖਨੇਰੇ ਵਾਂਗ ਮੇਰੇ ਤਸਵਰ ਉੱਤੇ ਛਾ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਈ ਵਾਰ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਚਿਰ ਬਾਰੀ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਕੁਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਦਿਸਦਾ ਕਦੇ ਕਦੋਂ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਕਦੋਂ ਤੂੰ ਨਜ਼ਰ ਭਰ ਕੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਤੱਕੇਗੀ ਤੇ ਕਦੋਂ ਮੇਰਾ ਚਾਨਣ ਮੇਰੇ ਵੱਲ ਦੇਖੇਗਾ ਕਦੋਂ ਕਦੋਂ ਮੈਂ ਤੇ ਮੇਰਾ ਤਸਵਰ ਰੋਸ਼ਨ ਹੋਵੇਗਾ ਤੇ ਤੂੰ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਕਦੋਂ ਮਿਲੇਗੀ ਫੇਰ ਮਿਲਣ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰ ਤੂੰ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਕਦੋਂ ਮਿਲੇਗੀ ਚੰਦ ਲਾਈਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਮਰੋਜ਼ ਚਿੱਠੀ ਲਿਖਦਾ ਆਪਣੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਦੇ ਫਲਸਫੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਦਿਲ ਦੀਆਂ ਤਰਕਨਾ ਉਸ ਅੰਮ੍ਰਿਤਾ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਂਝੀਆਂ ਕਰਦਾ ਹੱਤ ਇੱਕ ਵਸੀਲਾ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਆਉਂਦਾ ਸਾਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਚਿੱਠੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਲਿਖੇ ਹਰ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਦੀਆਂ ਰਮਜ਼ਾਂ ਸਮਝਦੇ ਪਛਾਣਦੇ ਤੇ ਹਰ ਸਿਆਹੀ ਚੋਂ ਨਿਕਲ ਲਹੂ ਦਾ ਰੰਗ ਬਣ ਇਮਰੋਜ਼ ਦੇ ਸਰੀਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅੱਜ ਵੀ ਅੰਮ੍ਰਿਤਾ ਨੂੰ ਯਾਦ ਕਰਦੇ ਤੇ ਇਮਰੋਸ ਇੱਕ ਲਾਈਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਪਣੀ ਕੁੱਲ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਦਾ ਫਲਸਫਾ ਦੱਸਦਾ ਹੈ ਜਦੋਂ ਉਹ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਅੰਮ੍ਰਿਤਾ ਮੇਰੀ ਨੰਗੀ ਪਿੱਠ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਉਂਗਲ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਹਿਲ ਦਾ ਨਾਮ ਲਿਖਦੀ ਨਾਮ ਸਾਹਿਲ ਦਾ ਪਰ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਤਸੱਲੀ ਇਸ ਕਰਦੀ thank you ਮੈਂ ਇੱਕ ਹੋਰ ਗੱਲ ਸੁਣਾ ਕੇ ਉੱਠਾਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਪਤਾ ਮੈਂ ਵੀ ਅੰਮ੍ਰਿਤਾ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲਣ ਗਈ ਸੀ ਉਹਦੇ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਵਾਲੇ ਘਰ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਤੇ ਕੱਲੀ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਗਈ ਸੀ ਮੀਟਿੰਗ ਲਈ ਮੈਂ ਪਹੁੰਚ ਗਈ ਉਹਦੇ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਪੌੜੀਆਂ ਤੇ ਹਰ ਪੌੜੀ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਆਇਤ ਲਿਖੀ ਹੋਈ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਰੋਜ਼ ਬੈਠਾ ਸੀ ਉੱਥੇ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਬੱਚਾ ਮਕਰ ਬੈਠ ਕੇ ਵੀ ਹੁਣ ਅੰਮ੍ਰਿਤਾ ਆਏਗੀ ਉਹਨੇ ਕੁਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿਹਾ ਥੋੜੀ ਦੇਰ ਬਾਅਦ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਕਾਵਾ ਪੀਏਗੀ ਮੈਂ ਜਿਸੇ ਵੀ ਹਲਾਤਾ ਕਾਵਾ ਵੀ ਆ ਗਿਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਚੁੱਪਚਾਪ ਪੀ ਲਿੱਤਾ ਮੈਂ ਫੇਰ ਪੌੜੀਆਂ ਵੱਲ ਦੇਖਾਂ ਕਿੰਦਾ ਅੰਮ੍ਰਿਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਆਉਣੀ ਮੈਂ ਕਿਹਾ ਕਿਉਂ ਮੈਂ ਦੇਖ ਕੇ ਤਾਂ ਚੱਲੀਏ ਨਾ ਤੂੰ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਦੱਸ ਜਦੋਂ ਤੂੰ ਵੱਡੀ ਉਮਰ ਦੀ ਹੋ ਜਾਏਂਗੀ ਬਿਮਾਰ ਹੋ ਜਾਏਂਗੀ ਤੇਰਾ ਜੀ ਕਰੂਗਾ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਕੋਈ ਦੇਖੇ ਮੈਂ ਨਾਨ ਪਲੱਸ ਸੀ ਮੈਂ ਕਿਹਾ ਪਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿੰਦਾ ਹੋ ਨਹੀਂ ਉਹ ਕਿਸੇ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲਦੀ ਹੁਣ ਉਹਨੇ ਚੱਲੀਏ ਹਰੀ ਚਾਦਰ ਪਾਈ which meant she will not see any baby ਮੈਂ ਕਿਹਾ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਕਿਸੇ ਨੂੰ ਫਿਰ ਜਸਟ ਟੂ ਅਮਿਊਜ਼ ਮੀ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਕੈਲੀਗ੍ਰਾਫੀ ਦੀ ਬਣਾਈਆਂ ਲਿਖੀਆਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਤਿੰਨ ਚਾਰ ਸਫੇ ਉਹਨੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਦੇ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਬੱਚੇ ਨੂੰ ਗਿਫਟ ਦੇ ਦਵਾਂ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਉਹ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਆ ਗਈ ਤੇ ਫਿਰ ਬੜੀ ਦੇਰ ਉਹ ਮੇਰੇ ਕੋਲੇ ਰਹੇ ਫਿਰ ਉਹ ਆਪਣਾ ਅਰੀਹਾਂਤ ਵਾਲਾ ਲੜਕਾ ਇੱਕ ਦਿਨ ਮੇਰੇ ਕੋਲ ਆਇਆ ਮੈਂ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਦਿਖਾਈਆਂ ਤੇ ਦੇਖ ਮੈਂ ਉਹ ਅਮਰੋਜ਼ ਨੇ ਦਿੱਤੀਆਂ ਸੀ